we don't look at people generally speaking as individuals we look at them as members of a group and then we form a conception about jews again about blacks about gays trans uh liberals conservatives uh, we just have these broad conceptions of different groups and when we encounter someone who belongs to a group we usually don't think of them primarily as an individual we, we usually think of them as primarily a, a member of a group and this saves us energy right Thinking burns a lot of calories, right? Thinking is really hard work, right? People who are doing strenuous mental labor will frequently be sweating, all right? They, they will frequently become hungry very quickly because they're burning up so many calories. And the human tendency is to try to avoid hard work. And made there be a red group and a blue group, it's shocking how quickly they will decide, like, this is the good group or the bad group. This is the smart group or the dumb group. People are really... That's what we do. Right, this is the cool group and this is the dumb group. This is a smart group. This group are a bunch of idiots, right? This is the good looking group and these other people are hideous apes, right? That's the way the world works, right? We don't care about our groups. We primarily care about our group and we follow the, the moral code of our group. We follow the hero system of our group and a component of that is uh, politics really great at uh, assigning importance to group labels. And this is you know, no less true of politics than it is of, of life in general. So what do I mean by groups? Uh, here I mean people who share some sort of common identity marker, either because they have adopted it, chosen to identify with it, or because it is ascribed to them by, by people in their life. And these groups have both definitional attributes that define their membership, and also a set of norms and expectations, values. Yeah, common identity, which is often popularly called race. Or, or religion, right? And it can also be profession, right? Or a, a particular type of culture. Use ideas about how members of the group should behave, even if those ideas are contested. So for example, I am a Californian. I've lived here for a long time, uh, and so you could call me a Californian and I couldn't tell you that's not true, even if I don't feel particularly connected to that identity. Um, but I also might adopt that identity. I might think of myself as a Californian and that might shape how I think about things. So in that sense, it could be both an ascribed and an adopted identity. And if you think about the question, you know, what are the stereotypes of Californians? What are Californians like? What would it mean to vote like a Californian? Ideas probably come to your mind. Um, so you might think stereotypically Californians cannot tolerate the kind of extremely humid weather for the Bay Area that we're having right now. It's intolerable. Um, you might think that Californians tend to care a lot about the environment or that they tend to vote liberal in elections. These are obviously contested. Obviously not all Californians are, are ascribed to these things, but if I were to ask you what the, what the identity means, these are some of the things that might come to mind. There are a lot of different groups that shape people's politics in a lot of different ways. Uh, of course, partisan groups are the most important of these, but there are also ideological groups, racial groups, religious groups, um, groups based on geography, on occupation, on ruralness and, and uh, urbanicity, and all of these. I remember I was at a uh, community college in an algebra class, right? I didn't do too well in, in math in high school. And I was coming out of class, some of my friends in, in class, what, one guy was in the middle of my friends and there was this one woman who was nearby who I was into. And my friend was talking about how stupid Republicans are. And everyone else agreed that Republicans were stupid. And I just knew inside, I did not have the strength to resist them. I did not have the inner reserves to stand up and say, no, Republicans are wiser. So this is the fall of 1985. It takes a tremendous amount of strength and energy to resist your group. Not many people are gonna do it. These things are important for how people think about politics and political issues. So what can groups do? What do I mean by shape political behavior? Uh, the set of things that groups, uh, groups can do for people's politics kind of fall into two buckets, uh, which I like to think of as the heart and the brain. Right, so I keep talking on this show that uh, looking at people as primarily individuals is not an effective way or an accurate way to describe reality, all right? We don't tend to look at people as individuals. You have to be a special person to merit me looking at you primarily as an individual. Instead, I, like almost everyone else, tends to put people into broad categories. And so the classical liberal conception that we are primarily individuals born with certain inalienable rights just does not match reality. Instead, we are primarily members of groups with obligations to our group and a worldview that we get from our group. We're shaped by the dominant genetics of our group, by early imprinting that we received in our group, and by the incentives that operate within our group. So thinking about the heart, uh, groups can give people- a Right, so the way news media talks about politics, they talk about it as though individuals are making decisions based on policy and ideology.
in reality, most people put very little effort into decoding politics and they just go along with their group, right? We're highly social creatures. Almost everything that we think and almost everything that we feel, right, we get that from the groups that we belong to. Emotional and affective stakes in political contests. So if you think about uh, a person and their elected official, uh, like a member of Congress, for example, they probably have never talked to one. So when I'm not feeling connected to a group, I just feel incredibly weak. All right, my illnesses are more devastating. When I stub my toe, it hurts more. Dental pain is more intense. My, my headaches are more disabling. I can't do as many pull-ups. Right? I, I notice that when I am thriving in life, I can do more pull-ups. So it took me about six months in, back in 2022 to be able to get up to, to one pull-up. And even though I was sick for the past eight days, I, last night I managed to do, do three and a half pull-ups at once. So I, I'm building back up there. But if I'd been struggling this week, right, I, I doubt I would have gotten even to three and a half pull-ups. It probably would have been more like two and a half. So when I am thriving, and thriving means I'm thriving with regard to other people. And even if I'm, say, alone for 48 hours and I feel like I'm thriving, I feel like I'm thriving because I'm doing things that I perceive as receiving you know, approbation from the people who most matter to me. Or I'm getting you know, positive feedback via email or over the telephone or via Zoom or in uh, comments to my YouTube channels or emails that I get. All right, I, I'm still getting built up by these social connections. And when I'm getting disconnected and when I'm failing with other people and feeling socially awkward, all right, then I just feel weaker and much more prone to suffering and have much less strength, much less ability to rebound against setbacks. Right? I'm just not nearly as, as flexible one another. They probably don't share a lot of the same friends or a lot of the same hobbies, but maybe they share a group identity. Maybe they're both Democrats or they're both Republicans. They're both union members or they're both Californians. That kind of sense of, sense of shared identity can help people uh, feel more common ground with political representatives or members of... If you don't feel common ground, you're, you're going to feel lost. Right? It's just the worst feeling. It's terrible for your health. You're going to lack all strength. You're not going to have the, the ability to get the things done that you need to get done, you're going to lack energy, you're going to lack drive, right? There's no true self, right? We know ourselves on the basis of how we interact with the people who are most important to us. And if we start falling out with the people who are most important to us, we, we wonder, who am I really? So I'm a convert to Orthodox Judaism, and I've only encountered two Jews in my 30 years in Judaism who said, I, I don't accept your conversion. And one of them was kidding. So if I formally converted to Orthodox Judaism, but I had a hard time being accepted as a fellow Orthodox Jew, then my self-conception of myself as an Orthodox Jew would, would dissolve. It would get weaker and weaker and weaker, right? Unless I, was, I am constantly getting reinforced in my identity as an Orthodox Jew, my identity is going to wither away, which is why traditional Jewish texts say, do not separate yourself from the community, because we know ourselves in large part by virtue of our membership in the community, whether it's a community of writers, of professors, of dentists, of doctors, of accountants. Of their constituency that are not necessarily very socially uh, proximate to one another. Groups can also give emotional stakes to politics. 